So let me tell you a story about a group of wandering gypsies that decided to settle down one day. Puppeteers, fire breathers, acrobats, stilt walkers, animal trainers. They wandered the land and people came from far and wide to see them perform. They came to get lost in the moment. They came to feel a little bit of magic. They came to suspend disbelief just for a moment. But the life of a wanderer is very tough and very tiring and they wanted to find a home. They looked for a little piece of jungle in the northern part of India and set up their simple homes. At first, it was quite simple. Canvas shelters, makeshift houses, three stones which they could build a fire and make some dinner. But they saw that life here was very good. So they stayed. Canvas turned to clay, clay turned to brick and mortar. But the world around them also changed. It became more crowded, it became busier, there was less time. They got swallowed by one of the largest cities on earth. And the people who lived in that city had very little time for magic anymore. Nobody wanted to pay attention to the stories. Nobody believed the tricks. Science and technology were far more fascinating. This sounds like a lost and mystical place, but it's a very real place in our very real time. It's the Kathbutli colony in central Delhi. It is the last magician's colony where artists and folk traditionists still live and is soon set to be bulldozed. These were the itinerants and the gypsies that didn't leave India. They didn't go down the Silk Road as you know them. They stayed inside India, they traveled around, moving from town to town, setting up their tight ropes. All came and they did quite well at it. Presidents and heads of state came to see them. They won some of the highest awards that their country could possibly offer. Their praises were sung by the rich and famous but now they're told they have to leave. Who has time for magic when there's video games and 3D movies? Their children have no more time to learn their traditions. People don't pay attention to their craft anymore. For artists like Puran Bhatt, one of the master puppeteers that live in the colony, they live in a very specific time and place, a place that it shared the world over. He holds thousands of years of old tradition, but he's faced with a world that has little time or patience for all that he knows. He can perform magic literally with his hands, 18 string puppets and a mouth harp, weaving together stories seamlessly of the kings and the queens and the commoners of ancient India, traveling and telling, breathing life into inanimate objects, things that have no life before he puts his hands in them and his imagination made out of cotton and wooden cloth, he tells a story. When I first met Peron at his home in central Delhi and we went to go visit him, he looked at me and he said, please make a recording of this place. Please make a video, a photograph, a document, something, because soon it's not going to exist anymore. You see, the land that Peron's home is built on has been sold by the government to developers. As another artist in the colony said to me, this is a river, and you can't stop a river. We live at a time of great technological achievement. All sorts of wizardry surrounds us. We have apps, we have instant communication, digital technologies abound. Soon we'll be able to 3D print anything from a hammer to a human organ. But we also live at a time where traditional culture is dying in a way that it never has before. It's dying faster than the coral reefs and faster than the rainforests and we need to sound an alarm. The New York Times reports that up to 25% of the world's 7,000 languages that still exist are in threat of extension. Compare that to 30% of amphibians, 21% of mammals, 15% of reptiles, and 13% of birds. Let that hit you just for a moment. It is my job as a cultural documentarian storyteller to bear witness. And over the past 15 years that I've been doing this, I bear witness to this river of globalization flooding everything and wiping out everything that doesn't fit its metric of value. I search the world over trying to find what remains, trying to capture it before it's lost. So where do I fit in? Anthropology and photography go remarkably hand in hand. I was drawn to both of them for the same reason. I wanted to sit near the other. I wanted to learn from them. I wanted to sit at their feet. The other is a really complex term in anthropology, right? As if there's some kind of norm. But for me growing up, there was no norm. I really wanted to know what was out there. I wanted to explore all the possibility of the world. I wanted to see all the ways of being so I could figure out how I wanted to be. 
But anthropology as an academic discipline to me felt also like a little dry. I needed a little bit more. I craved the wet lab of human experience and culture. I wanted to see it, and I wanted to taste it, and I wanted to smell it. I had to get out there, and photography gave me the ability to do that. It gave me the ability to step into the world and feel what was out there for myself and bring something back from that experience. But each time I went to go tell one of these stories, there was a similar thread that ran through all of them. Where it was the traditional healers in Panama or the Jews of India, whether it was a craft tradition or a native knowledge system, I was always told that these are the last of their kind. There is nobody there to continue this work. And so just as I was filled up with all this possibility, all these different ways of being and potential, my heart also became very sad looking at the bleakness for the future for all these traditions that I'd come to admire. You see, culture is funky. It's tough to quantify. And if you can't quantify it, it's often just taken away by that river. So I see it as my job to reflect that beauty back into the world, the diverse approaches to ways of life, and to create a document of all these things before they're lost. Now let me take you someplace else. This is Lamu. It's an island off the east coast of Kenya. It was established in the 14th century as a really important port on the northern sea trade route. It is East Africa and Kenya's oldest continuously inhabited town and is literally a living time capsule of heritage. Spice ports are really interesting places, right? Because they have all this layering of culture that come and fills in on top of each other. Spices from India, boats from China, religions from the Northeast and are from, from North Africa and the Middle East. And all these things fill up and you can see them and you can taste them in the food and you can feel them in the air and you see them in the people's faces. But you can't talk about Lemur without talking about this apocryphal cultural object, the Tao. Beautiful long hauled wooden ships with big cargo payloads to carry everything that came between Lamu and the rest of the world. This was the vessel of choice for all the traders that came and went for Lamu for so very long. So much so that you can't talk about Lamu without talking about the master of the craftsmen that build these Daos. Right here you see pictured Ali Atman Skanda, one of the last bearers of this native tradition. Ali is a master craftsman. He can work wood like no other, as if he has eyes on the palms of his hands. He is considered a fundi, a master craftsman. His work stands out above all others. He was trained by his father and his father before him. But Ali hasn't made a Tao for many, many years. And the reason is quite simple. The Tao is now being replaced by fiberglass boats. Why would you invest all that time and making a boat that takes months and takes so much time when you can just have it in weeks for much cheaper. Now, the death of craft traditions isn't anything new, right? We see them all the time. Craft traditions are usually utilitarian solutions to functional problems. And once that problem is gone, so is the need for the solution. And we see it over and over and over and over. But I want to posit a question to you. When we lose something like the Tao, are we really just losing a boat? Are we losing something much bigger? Because cultural systems, much like ecological systems, are really complex. They're webs that stretch and connect to things that we don't understand. If you remove a species from an ecological system, you don't know everything that that species fed upon or fed upon it, and every attachment it had. You don't know the fragile links that it may have been exposed by taking it away. And the same thing exists within cultural ecosystems. When you take away the data that was so central to an entire cultural evolution, are you really just taking away a boat? Can you expect the culture to not change around it? Culture is our uniquely funky way of dealing with the world around us. Our negotiation over biology and the environment. It's smelly, it's weird, it's colorful, it's really, really interesting, and it's really tough to quantify. But I have to say, it's a pretty good tool. If you think about it, we've been able to live almost anywhere. We live in the jungles, we live in the desert, we live in the Arctic. We live under the sea, we live over the sea. We live on the International Space Station. Pretty soon we're going to be able to live on Mars. But all these differences of being and all these ways of being and all these diverse approaches represent our toolkit for dealing with the problems. As the globe becomes more crowded, as we're faced with bigger and bigger challenges, and we're faced with feeding massive amounts of people, disease, global warming, it's all these diverse approaches 
that create our tool sets for solving them. And as we become more as we become more homogenized and we start putting our cultures aside, we're losing those diversity of approaches and we're losing them at an incredibly rapid rate. You see, most of these traditions are oral traditions, right? So they're passed from elder to young, from one generation to the next. And once one generation isn't willing to see it, it is gone and lost forever. And Western culture has a really powerful glow. It has sizzle, it has shine. So if the young people are sitting in the villages and watching MTV and on Facebook and doing everything that everyone else is doing, they usually have little time or interest in their own culture. It's really not a fair comparison. These traditions took thousands of years to develop. They harmonize our mind and our body and our spirit. And I would argue that this pace of development and loss is speeding up in a way that we've never seen before. We need to sound alarm. We need to save our cultures. And this is not just any knowledge we're losing. This is our human story. This is everything. This is our collective lifetimes of data aggregation on how to best sustain ourselves before, co before commodities and industry started to do so. It's how we knew how to get by. So I'm going to tell you one more story. In the small town of Ketchikan in southeast Alaska that sits at the foothills of the Tongass National Forest. It is home at this point to many different types of peoples, but first it was host to the native peoples of the area. A rich and proud tradition that was washed away that now sits on the far side of the cultural process. You see, the native peoples that lived there, the Klinkit, the Haida, and the Shimshin, had complex native knowledge systems, navigation, astronomy, ecology, deep concepts of space and time that we can only begin to understand. And they had all these things within their realm of knowing. But when the first white settlers came in there, they did not see the value in this native culture. It was considered uncivilized. It was considered backwards. And therefore, there was no efforts to preserve it, no efforts to save it. On top of all this, if this wasn't bad enough, the young were sent to Indian boarding schools where they weren't allowed to speak their languages, they weren't allowed to practice their culture. And what cultural hegemony didn't do, disease did. Smallpox wiped out scores of natives, leaving them with almost no one to pass on a tradition. Sometimes we give our culture away, and sometimes it's taken from us. The native peoples recognizing what was happening to them, realizing the fragility of this oral tradition, that soon there would be no one to pass it forward, that it would be entirely gone within a generation, started a focused cultural reclamation project, teaching weaving, teaching dancing, teaching carving, teaching language. They realized that the best way to preserve culture is to share it. Now, the Tlingit, the Shimshian, and the Haida take their culture out take it from where it was once hidden and bring it out in full light of day. They stand in the shadows of their ancestors proudly, carrying on the traditions that were once in threat of being lost. And they do this not just for themselves, they do it for all of us. As a very good friend of mine, an artist, Mary Henderson, told me, when we lose these things, we're not just losing a craft tradition, we're not just losing a language, we're losing something far more than that. We're losing a mythology we're losing our human experience completely. You see, sitting next to a master and learning a craft tradition, it's not just learning a craft tradition. It's not just passing data. It's not just passing information. It's passing a way of life. And with that life comes a way of seeing the world, a way of understanding it. And without it, we lose years of adaptation and survival and humor. We are much less free as we walk this earth. We're much less aware of everything that's around us. And I would suggest that we're far poorer as human beings. You see, culture cannot sit on a shelf. It can't sit there and get dusty. It's not a diorama that you'd see in a display. You have to take it down. You have to dance with it. You have to smell it. You have to sit at its feet and feel its magic. Because when you do that, you can walk the tightrope. You can sail under the stars of the Indian Ocean. You can walk with the native healers. In a time of fast and easy and convenient, it's often easy to lose sight of why we maintain culture. We've replaced craft with commodity. 
These things that once had so much meaning to us are now superficial and disconnected. This is not the life I want. I challenge that most of you don't want this life either. We don't want a life filled with richness, filled with stories, filled with the ways of the people that came before us. For this is what it means to be human. Thank you.